Are we going to show the DNA or are we not going to show the DNA? Are things opening up in the uh, Koberger case or are things being sealed again in the Koberger case? You would think that as the case goes on, that things would seem clear and make a little bit more sense. But things just keep getting messier and messier. So there's been talk about things getting more opened up. But are we really opening up more facts about this case? In this episode of About the Law, we're going to be discussing some new updates with the Koberger case. I'm Lainey Law. And I'm attorney Andrew Myers. Now, what is going on? We're sealing documents. We're unsealing documents. The DNA is getting shared. We're not sharing the DNA. There's books all over the place. What is happening? Well... We have three more, I guess we could call them bumps in the road this week. We've called them red flags. We've called them head scratchers. We could call them bumps in the road. But three kind of contradictory developments. One is uh, the defense wants to open and unseal one motion and then clamp down on another one. Another one is a book that the university president wrote. What? What's that all about? But we start our quest down this bumpy, bumpy uh, road this week with a motion uh, that was allowed by the judge. Uh, at first, the whole thing was entirely sealed, and then a, a public uh, order came out saying that some of the investigative genetic genealogy information, the background IgG and the DNA test, a portion of that is, in fact, going to be allowed by the court. A portion, <laughs> not a even portion. all of it. So what is that all about? Let's take a look. Here is the public order for disclosure of the IgG information. This is the court's order. Some people have just read it to people. Uh, we're not going to do that. We're going to say, wait a minute. What does that mean? <laughs> what does that mean? A portion of the IgG information. Uh, what this is, is the court has said, OK, we are going to order that the prosecution turn over to the defense a portion of the IgG information. Well, now, wait a minute. Um, you might ask me, well, all right, there's some confidentiality concerns and all that kind of good stuff. What's the problem with that? I'd be screaming. <laughs> Let me tell you what the problem with that is. All right. So now the IgG was part of the process by which the alleged um, DNA of Mr. Kohlberger was found, or uh, strike what I just said, some alleged DNA was found on a knife sheath. And through this long process, it was linked through familial ties to Mr. Kohlberger. The defense rightfully points out, wait a minute, we have a right to see that process. And the state said, no, 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 because we didn't use any of that when we caught him. We then got a direct swab and that tied him in at that point. But the defense said, wait, we have a right to take a look at that process. And the court said, well, after a long argument, some of it was closed, some of it was open. The court said, well, turn over all the stuff to us and we'll decide. So now the court says, well, all right, we'll let the defense have a portion of it. Well, here's the problem with that. The problem is that at trial, very likely the state of Idaho will have their experts say, Here's our expert, and our expert went through this process and that process, and we did the routine procedure, and we linked Mr. Koberger to the DNA material that was on the knife sheath through this process. Okay, fine. Wonderful. Defense comes up. Defense has their own expert if they're doing their job, which I'm certain they will be. And the defense expert is on the stand, and you being the good lawyer, you start asking me, you know, all these questions, you know, did you follow this procedure? Yes. Did you follow that procedure? Yes. When cross-examined, the defense expert has asked, well, you didn't see all of it, did you? Well, no, we only had a portion of it. Aha, so you didn't see the whole process, did you? So you don't know about the whole process, do you? So there's the, there's the credibility of the defense expert. I mean, this is, this is a problem. This is a problem that the defense does not have access to all of the IgG process that led to the DNA identification. Sure. Tell me it had nothing to do with the um, identification or the DNA a positive ID. Well, if that's true, what is there to fear? Why are you setting the defense up to fail? So this is a clear fail. 
This is a clear fail where the um, state's expert will have full, complete access to the entire procedure, and the defense expert will be able to be cross-examined and impeached because he did not see the entire process. And how is that going to look to a jury? Here's your answer. Not good. Okay. The next bump in the road this week is something that's somewhat problematical. As we've pointed out before, there are over 20 books on the Idaho 4 case. Uh, I went on Amazon dot com just before we did this episode here that we're uh, doing right now and here are 10 of the books here are 10 of the books um we've talked about one of them before i uh invited the author he's uh, declined our invitation so far but there are 10 don't you find that odd that there are 10 different books about this case and the case is still ongoing i think it's you know it's a part of me I want to be open-minded because obviously we sit here and we do this podcast and we give our commentary. But when you're writing a book, I, it feels a little disingenuous. I mean, obviously people have part one, part two, part three of their books, but you're writing a book on maybe like 10% of, you know, what the actual case in question is that we haven't had a trial. The defense can't even get the, <laughs> the evidence they need. Like, so it's insane uh, to think that you were having what's sold to us and what are meant to be perceived as full books for something that's still ongoing. Yeah, exactly. And uh, Mr. Uh, Howard Bloom, who was very controversial, some people uh, give him a lot of credence, as I do. Other people, and they have every right to their opinion, they don't give him a lot of credence, but the man has won awards. Uh, and he's done some good work in the past, and he's published in places uh, like the New York Times and Rolling Stone, and uh, he, he's got a good record. He's coming out with a book, it is said, in the very near future. So in addition to the 20 or so books that are already out there, wait a minute, what is this? Another one. Well, but wait a minute. This is a book that was authored by C. Scott Green. Wait a minute, we know him. He is the president of the University of Idaho. He's writing a book about Koberger? Well, not really. This is a book entitled University President's Crisis Handbook, How a Non-Traditional Leader Took His Alma Mater from Insolvency to Sustainable Success. Well, all right. I, I got the book. I got it and I downloaded it on Kindle and... The reason I didn't read all the entire book is this. It's not really a book on the Koberger Idaho 4 case. What it is, is it is a university president's handbook on how to run a university when you have crises. Now, Mr. Green was hired to be the president of the University of Idaho in 2019. They were in a deep, deep, deep deficit at that time. So he was instrumental, according to this book, at bringing the university out of that and putting them on the road to financial success. I just oh, quick what you said 2019. What year did you say? Sorry. 2019. 2019. 2019. So we're accomplishing sustainable success in five years. Okay. I'm just sorry. You, <laughs> I'm just, I'm, oh, you need a little yeah. thing. I'm just telling you what the book says. Okay. I'm just, and then, and then think about this. This book is about three crises. That's the first one. The second crisis, what happened a year after 2019? Oh, the pandemic. The pandemic. So now he's fighting to keep the, according to the book, folks, according to the book. <laughs> I don't know. I wasn't there. So comment all you want and say, Mr. Myers, you weren't there. You don't know. But as true as that is, um, the uh, COVID pandemic hit in 2020, and it just challenged every institution there is. The University of Idaho is not unique, but they had to figure out what we're going to do. Are we going to shut it down? Or are we going to keep classes going? Are we going to send the students home? Are we going to teach by Zoom? So they, in the book, he talks about kind of a meld of all of these things. So that's the first 300, 400 pages of the book. It's all, you know, I actually used to have a friend who was a mid-level administrator at a university. And, you know, these universities have huge bureaucracies. It's, you know, it's like the government. They've got huge, huge, huge bureaucracies. And if you're a low to mid-level administrator, sure, you'd like to find out how they do stuff in other universities. So this book is for you. It's bureaucratise. It's administrative ease. It's all that stuff, how to run a university through these crises. Well, then the very, 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 very last chapter comes along and it's like when evil strikes. 
And that was what happened uh, on November 13th of 2022. So we're not going to read the whole chapter. We're going to take little excerpts and say, what is this all about? So um, in the book, it says, and I quote, we had a strong suspicion Greek students were involved because of reports we've heard. Well, you're writing a book that's, uh, what reports? What did these reports say? When you say we had a strong suspicion Greek students were involved, you mean that the um, as some uh, speculations have gone that a sorority or fraternity was involved in this case, or just that you suspected that the four students who uh, were no longer uh, alive after this, that they were members of fraternities or sororities? That turned out to be true, but what does that quote even mean? Quote two, frankly, the town was ill prepared for a crime of this magnitude, and that's attributed to President Green, and we can see how that was true. The town was not prepared for a crime of this magnitude. They're still not prepared. They're like trying to move things around the school year and get things done in the summer. Right. Uh, here's a couple of more quotes from the book, and I'm gonna I'm gonna have as few comments as possible. MPD, Moscow Police Department, and the University of Idaho held daily briefings. Wait a minute. Is the universe when did the University of Idaho become an investigative agency for crimes? According to this, MPD and the University of Idaho held daily briefings with each other. But Blaine, now Blaine is the, um, he has two titles. This is this refers to Bl Blaine Eccles. He has a PhD. He's the vice president of students, and he's also the dean of students. So that's who this refers to. Blaine emphasized that the University of Idaho had no, quote, insider information about the status of the investigation or leads on who committed the crime. The university provided as much information as they could to the police working through um, working through the general counsel's office to ensure the details shared were done so legally. Wait a minute. I said I wasn't going to comment, but how credible is it that the Manchester, Manchester, <laughs> good grief. <laughs> how credible is it that the Moscow Police Department and the University of Idaho held daily briefings with each other, but. The University of Idaho had no insider information. Oh, come <laughs> on. Do you believe that? They're just talking about the weather. I don't know what you're thinking. <laughs> okay. The governor was so supportive, immediately pledging $1 million to accommodate our response to the crime and giving the green light to the Idaho State Police to provide help. Uh, ultimately, the uh, state of Idaho gave the university $2 million in it. I don't know if that was ever audited, but let's move along to a couple more quotes out of the university professor's book. In the coming weeks, social media chat board experts wrongly accused several students and employees of the crimes. The impact was devastating with overwhelming scrutiny, hate mail, and harassment forcing these students into hiding. Uh, the Moscow Police Department publicly cleared those wrongfully accused but that meant little to those who continued to believe they knew better than the investigators. Well, all right. A lot of people out there believe that the MPD uh, may have cleared some people a little bit too quickly. But be that as it may, I promise not to comment too much. Despite the fact that the crime was committed off campus by an individual from another state. See how they're trying to distance themselves from this? On the one hand, they were on top of the problem, but now they're trying to kind of distance themselves away from it a little bit. Uh, despite the fact that the crime was committed off campus by an individual from another state, we would have to counter the view that the university is unsafe. So, you know, all right. And this is the last quote we're going to besiege you with. And by the way, all the way over on the right hand side of the photograph, uh, the guy with the gold or yellow tie, uh, that's the university president. That's Mr. Green. Immediately after the accident, we set up a morning briefing and an afternoon debriefing. What, you get briefed in the morning and debriefed in the after? I'm not even going to comment on that. <laughs> that included our university team and law enforcement. This is uh, Look how tightly they're working together, apparently, yet they have no inside information. No inside information, even though they're briefing in the morning and debriefing in the afternoon. Uh, this eventually evolved into one daily meeting. Law enforcement will not give you details about the investigation. Wait a minute. 
If they won't give you details, why are you meeting twice a day? What are they talking about? I I don't I don't know who I even meet with once a day, multiple times a day that I have things to say. What like what can I join these mm-hmm. debriefings? I don't know. I mean, maybe <laughs> no they're talking about a type of latte they're going to get that after. I just I it just I don't know. It's a lot of words, but there's not a lot of sense in here. We don't know anything, but also, you know, we made sure to talk all the time. When we realized how complex this case was and would not likely get solved in a matter of days, that helped us plan. No, I just, I, I just, I'm, I'm speechless, which I guess happens more often than it really should lately. But I mean, th- that's the comment that they were working together closely. And this is the same university president. And with all due respect for the president, he's got all this education and he saved them from the jaws of insolvency and all this stuff i'll say i almost said a different word <laughs> um this is the same university president that said you know uh, the university owned 1122 king road and he said we've got to destroy it so we can move along and people will stop thinking about it well it seems to me that ever since they tore down that property people are talking about it more that's only my observation but i mean it's the same guy so you don't think your problems get solved when you sweep them under the rug no of course they do yeah <laughs> just walk away just, just walk pretend they don't. Yeah, yeah. they're not there my problems the are always gone. Just, if you ignore your problems <laughs> they'll go away sure <laughs> okay so this brings us to point number three bump in the road number three for the Coburger case today and that is that there was a January 12th, 2024 motion to unseal the defendant's motion to reconsider orders denying the motions to dismiss the indictment and in the alternative for permission to appeal from the interlocutory orders. So this is the whole, yeah, this is the whole um, (laughs) issue about that the grand jury had some issues. It was biased and the exculpatory evidence wasn't presented and a few other charges. So the whole thing's been under wraps. The whole thing's been under seal. You know, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. Now, all of a sudden, on January 12th, there's this motion to unseal the defendant's motion. So we can finally see what those arguments were. So a lot of people said, this is great. Some uh, some of the uh, mystery is coming off the Koberger case. They're opening up the Koberger prosecution. We're all going to see more. Woo! Wait a minute. Not so fast. Just calm down over there. <laughs> January 17th, kind of like the little girl on the bottom right hand corner there. Now the, there's a motion to seal their reply to the state's objection to their motion for the interlocutory relief. So womp, womp. wait a minute. <clears throat> One day, January 12th, they want to unseal their motion. Then only, what's that, five days later, they want to seal their reply. To the state's objection. So, no, it's silliness. Just, it's just, it's a bit much. So, let's uh, take a look at these uh, motions and maybe our commenters or maybe you, Lainey, can make some sense of all this. Here's the, uh, here's the ori- original motion that gave people some heart that maybe things are going to open up here. Some people said, geez, maybe they're going to open things up and we can all start. You know, in a motion to unseal, see what's going on. So you read through this, uh, and uh, the motion is made on the grounds that the pleadings and hearing thereon do not need to be sealed. And they quote two things, Idaho Criminal Administrative Rule 32 and Idaho Criminal Rule 6. Well, how many people do you know actually looked at those rules to see what they said? You know, we attorneys are only supposed to cite stuff that makes sense. So I I just want to say that paper doesn't make sense because why would they say the ICAR and then afterwards write out the Idaho criminal rule? I'm just saying my English teacher wouldn't be very happy with that. Just putting that out there. Well, they put the abbreviation first. Yeah, that's not that's (laughs) not that's not a that's not an an incomprehensible question. But there's a little blue book um called the standards of citation and i'm sure in that little blue book that i have not looked at for a long time it actually tells you how to properly cite Mm. you know rules cases statutes trust me there's a little blue book somewhere that tells that that justifies this in any event i took a look at icar 32 idaho court administrative rule 32 and what does it say it says of course quote 
the public has a right to access the judicial department's declarations of law and public policy and to access the records of all proceedings open to the public. So that gives us some hope that there's actually some um, precedent in Idaho to open these things up. And it goes A, B, C, D, E, F, G, you know, why, when and where these things should be kept open. And I'm not the only person who said The courts are ours. They're not yours. They're ours. We pay for them with our taxes. And the Constitution says we, the people, create the government. So it's for the people to know. And it's not for the government to go, oh, hush, hush, be quiet. Uh, But then, of course, down at the bottom of uh, Idaho Court Administrative Rule 32, all the way at the bottom, it says, well, okay, there are some exceptions. And then if you look at Idaho Criminal Rule 6, what that is, is the um, rules. And we're not going to get into them all because we'd be here all day. But Idaho Criminal Rule 6 speaks of formation of the grand jury. There will be 16 jurors. Only 12 are a quorum. And that was one of the issues in the original motion to dismiss the um, indictment. There was an allegation that not enough jurors were sitting the whole time. So it would be nice if this were opened up and we could take a look because Idaho Criminal Rule 6 uh, says, you know, you've got to impanel 16 jurors, but only 12 are required to show up for a quorum. And it, of course, says that the selection process and everything else are done in closed session. So that's the motion that was brought by the defense. And here is the signature of Ann Taylor, public defender, Kootenai County public defender, Ann Taylor. So she wants to open things up. Wait a minute. Five days later, we have a motion <laughs> They were so close. They could have made us happy. They were so close. So here we go. Um, And we've already looked at Idaho uh, criminal administrative rule 32, but now they want to seal their response to when the state objected to their motion for interlocutory relief. In other words, the state doesn't want them taking this upstairs to an appeal court. So they had to object. They want to seal their own reply. So, so which is it? Do they want do they want it to be open or do they want it to be closed? And of course, this is just the motion to seal their reply. This isn't the actual motion itself. So we're not allowed to see that. We're not allowed to see that. So we go back to the little girl on the slide who's saying, let's play hide and seek. And so I don't know. The whole thing continues to be quite a mystery. The whole thing continues to be um a story of contradictions and the whole thing seems to just leave, you know, those of us on the outside who would like to uh, look in um, just shaking our heads and going, what? I don't even, can you explain to me, I guess the point of unsealing it in the first place and then also to go back and seal their response. I mean, do they benefit from that in any way, shape or form? Is it just to kind of appease the public well, far be it from me. It would it would just, it would seem that there are some matters that are in their um, objection, uh, their response to the state's objection that they just feel must be covered by that uh, rule six in Idaho that says that the grand jury proceedings have to be kept. See, I mean, we have to be really careful here because grand jury proceedings, in fact, in every state, the Idaho, I'm only licensed in Massachusetts and New York, but grand jury proceedings are to be secret. And for good reason, you know, there are a lot of people out there uh, running around in a society who are, you know, doing whatever they're doing and they're not on the up and up. And, you know, if someone is going to indict them and potentially have them uh, go away for a time, or as in the Koberger case, he could face potentially the firing squad. You want to keep these people uh, and the processes that they go through private. And Even I, a huge advocate, as you know from what I just said two minutes ago, I'm a huge advocate of of keeping all of this stuff public. You know, there there are reasons for um, the grand jury proceedings to be conducted in private. And there there are reasons to protect grand jurors against, you know, whatever wrath could come against them uh, from people that are being indicted. So that's that's my speculation based on my understanding of the rules and the procedures. So I don't know if that answers your concern. It doesn't really answer mine, but that's kind of, you know, where we are right now. So um, it's very messy. It's overall very messy. It's overall very confusing. Uh, It makes it look like at one point they're open to kind of opening up the case up a little bit more and then they're resealing it. It just seems all over the place. It just... (laughs) 
a little messy. Now, we often do our comments. We decided not to do our comments this week, but I did get one comment uh, from an episode we did previously where I talked about the Nebraska Press Association case. Remember that one where uh, the Supreme Court considered a uh, absolute prior restraint gag order on a case and uh, the court, the United States Supreme Court says there has to be a balancing between the public's right to know and the defendant's right to a fair trial. And both of those are important. And the learned justices of the United States Supreme Court and their court clerks who do a great deal of research, they said there's no precedent for anyone anywhere uh, in any writing uh, other than maybe some newspaper garbage uh, that one of those rights is takes precedent over the other. Well, I did get a comment. <laughs> I got a comment from one uh, viewer and we love, we love comments. Please keep commenting. Even if you disagree with what I've said, or I'm going to say right now. And that is, yes, there is a balancing this, this commenter said, forget about the free, uh, the, 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 the free, the press, the press has no place in this. The only concern is, you know, making sure that the defendant gets a fair trial and good. If they keep everything secret, that's good, because if that protects the integrity of the investigation, that's good. But we all want the integrity of the investigation. And if Mr. Koberger or whoever is guilty, we want them to be found guilty. Absolutely. That's that's how we do justice in the United States of America. But yes, in fact, it's not me. I'm not saying that you have to do a balancing act. That's the United States Supreme Court, and it's right there. And it's also um, the balancing of those two competing interests was also um, mentioned at the very top of the non-dissemination order by Judge John Judge. He put that right in the opening uh, paragraph of the non-dissemination order that we have to balance the First Amendment rights against the Sixth Amendment rights and the Fourteenth Amendment rights. So that's not me saying it. That's the courts uh, much higher up than my pay grade telling us that we have to balance. So please comment. But just because you comment doesn't mean that we're going to say, oh, yeah, you're right, because you weren't. <laughs> no. I feel like, I mean, not that I'm ever going to be on trial for something like this. But if I was ever in this public of a court case or not even a public court case, it's just like, I don't know. Maybe it's a generally generational thing that I'd be concerned of, you know, having my own rights stifled. I would want transparency because how else can you really verify that things are being done correctly? I don't know. I think maybe I, obviously each case is unique, but I think that uh, releasing information is part of a fair trial because you never know what happens. You never know what kind of biases there are now at the same time i kind of empathize to a point because if i was the jury on this case i mean i'm not even the jury on this case i'm nosy everybody here watching this video i love you but you're a little bit nosy we're all trying to figure out more and more what's <laughs> happening like, so i'm not gonna say that because you know we we're on youtube and we're saying reasonable things on youtube but all, we all know there's a crazy website saying crazy things and reddit holes that go on forever and ever so i can understand to a degree but at the same time i think i don't know i think transparency is important i think the reason this thing has kind of gotten this blown up out of proportion portion is because there's no transparency. And I think that's where a lot of the misinformation is coming from, too. Well, this goes to another comment that I got this week. And again, we, we decided not to read them this week, but there was another one that stood out to me. Uh, I was being scolded, I think. People like to scold me. Well, <laughs> this one commenter, uh, it was a really brief comment, and I can't tell you what it said word to word, but they didn't like us talking about the case because they said, we don't like the past. The past is the past. So, you know, but, you know, the things we're talking about here, I mean, you know, I know all about the Banfield incident. I know all about the tunnels. I know all about, <laughs> you know, Demetrius and Emma. And I know all about all this other stuff. And people have gone on and on and on and on. And that's for another channel, another day, another place. Because, you know what? <sighs> As an attorney, I want to look forward. I do want to look forward. I do want to look at this case. And I, we, we have tended to spend 
some time on a little bit of that, yes, but we have tended to look more forward as to, you know, what's going on in this case. I mean, take today's episode, uh, for example, uh, we talked about uh, the DNA and the fact that, you know, only a portion is going to be allowed. Well, that affects the trial that potentially um, impacts upon the credibility of an expert in the case. So we're looking forward. The second thing was this book by the university president and, you know, the fact that there's some other books coming out in the near future. Uh, and the other thing where we're looking forward is what about, why are they saying, well, we want to seal this motion, but unseal that motion. I mean, I'm confused. So yeah, we, we do tend to look forward and we have other episodes coming up that uh, we will continue to look how things that are happening today are going to impact the trial, which is somewhere in the future. So I don't, I don't, you know, that was a great comment. Thank you for the comment. We, you know, in a way you keep us honest when you don't agree with us because we hear what you're thinking out there. And I do definitely want to say for anybody thinking of leaving comments, please do please leave comments of what you want us to cover. Uh, also leave comments of what times you like to go checking around for YouTube. And if you guys think that there's any times that you'd like to see our videos, we don't have a posting schedule right now, but give us a little inspiration, especially if anybody, uh, cause I know some YouTubers watch our videos. So thank you to all the other YouTubers that, uh, enjoy our channel. We see you. We appreciate you. But let us know your opinion. Let us know your opinion on everything. I, I sure. mean, this channel is about you guys to like, you know, if it weren't for the comments, if it weren't for you guys watching, uh, we wouldn't be here. So thank you all for uh, every input that you give us. Yeah, we're having a friendly disagreement. <laughs> We're having a friendly disagreement. As soon as the camera goes off, we're having a friendly disagreement uh, about whether we should start posting these at a uniform time every week and um, whether it should be this time or that time and whether it should be the same time every week. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. Well, so sure. Let us know uh, what is a good regular time for you. I have said that if I can see a good time, that's a regular time that people want to see the podcast drop. Let us know. Let us know. You know. Be I'm very vocal. Be very vocal. <laughs> be very vocal. That, yeah, it doesn't matter. Be very vocal about anything, even beyond the schedule. You know, just tell us how your day is going. Honestly, I'll read it. I enjoy those. <laughs> There's just one more comment I wanted to make about um, the um, hostility to the press and the guy, the comment that we got about uh, there's no such thing as the, you know, the, the right of the press or the, you know, people don't have any right to, to know anything. Uh, you know, one more thing I wanted to say about that, and that is um, the court generally in the Murdoch case has worked with the media and specifically in the upcoming hearing that is coming up on uh, whether or not uh, Mr. Murdoch will get a retrial um, as uh, hard nosed. And it's not just me saying that folks, I, I listen and I read, I'm one of the last people in the world that still reads a newspaper as hard nosed as the judge has been in setting down some very strict ground rules in that case. They're very open with the media there are rules. Yes, you can't show the jurors. You can't do this. You can't do that. But that very hard-nosed judge is working with, voila, court TV. Whatever you think about them, I happen to like them. But they're working with the media in televising that hearing. And they're saying, here's how you're going to do it. You're not going to show the jurors. We're going to refer only to the jurors by number, not their name. And you're not to follow them. You're not to publicize them. We don't want you, um, you know, tailing the jurors. But in that case, in the court in South Carolina, they're working with the media, unlike the people in Idaho that just want us to, you know, dry up and go away. So, <laughs> Sweep it yeah. under the rug. I mean, I think that's such a good point, too, because it's not a case like too dissimilar where it's a murder case and, you know, it involves multiple murders. And I think you bring up a good point where they're allowing the media in as long as the media is being respectful. And I understand with Idaho that maybe, you know, the media hasn't been respectful up until this point. But I think that without, you know, some level of transparency and accountability that it's very hard to maintain justice. You can say, you know, whatever you want. Um at the end of the day. And I think that unfortunately we live in a society where a lot of people do have trust issues and authority. And I think that a little bit more transparency uh, is going to help settle a lot of things. I think that we're in a frenzy right now because there isn't transparency and I don't know, I'm not obviously a specialist in this field of, 
media and court interaction but i feel like i don't know i just i just strongly feel that this we wouldn't it wouldn't be the phenomena that it is if there wasn't as much secrecy yeah and i guess uh, i don't want to belabor the point the final thing that i'll say is this is that people do have curiosity forget about the first amendment forget about the free press free speech you know i could lecture you and i have for hours <laughs> i've actually taught a class in that um but um you're not going to turn off people's innate curiosity. No one in the world, I don't care whether he or she wears robes or who they think they are, you're not going to turn off natural curiosity. And people are going to want to know what happened. How did it happen? Where did it happen? Who did it happen? You know, all what, where, when, how, who, and why. They're going to want to know those questions. So uh, people that are in uh, higher positions have a choice. Either they can work with people and set up reasonable ground rules, or they can try and shut them out, in which case they're just going to go around the back and do whatever they can. So am I justifying some of the crazy stuff that's out there, the tunnel stuff? I mean, no, I'm not. I'm not going to endorse any of that crazy stuff. My only point is that people are curious. There is an active press in this country. And they're going to do a job. If you work with them, they'll work with you. If you don't work with them, they'll work around you. That's all I have to say. So those are my closing thoughts. Do you have any, Lainey, before we head out of the shop yeah. here? I mean, I just like I mentioned, <laughs> out of the shop. like I mentioned, I do appreciate all the YouTubers that watch us. And I appreciate that everybody's, you know, the people that do take an interest to the case and all the media that we do have out there. And I hope that, you know, especially now with the ease of access of communication, that uh things do become more transparent and that you know i you said you're the last one of the last people to watch, read the newspaper i do hope that we continue to have journalists that uh really try to look deep into cases and yeah and yeah thank you guys everybody who's watched up until this point be sure to tell us what you think I had one final, final, final thought. We asked several episodes ago, what is that building in the background? And uh, a couple of people guessed, nobody got it right. Somebody said it's either a school or a court. Which school or court and where is it? <laughs> That's it, have a good day. You have been watching About the Law, a production of the law offices of Andrew D. Myers in Methuen, in the Merrimack Valley of Massachusetts, and in Derry, just outside of Manchester, New Hampshire. Remember to click the like and subscribe buttons down below. And if you enjoyed this video, be sure to share it with your friends and others. If you'd like to talk to me about an injury case, a car accident, a slip and fall, a serious bodily injury case, or some other case, please feel free to contact me. I'd love to talk to you. You can contact us through my website at attorney-myers.com. We have a contact us block, or you can call on one of the telephone numbers we've given there, or you can email me at andrew at attorney-myers.com. The foregoing is offered for informational purposes only. It is not intended as and does not constitute legal advice. Laws vary widely from state to state. You should rely only on the advice given to you during a personal consultation by a local attorney thoroughly familiar with state laws and the area of practice in which your concern lies. This podcast must be and hereby is labeled advertisement in some jurisdictions. No tunnels. And that's that. There are two tunnels. How can you say that? There are tunnels. No tunnels. There are tunnels. Don't listen to her. Tunnels. No. Tunnels. No. Tunnels. No. Why won't